God, thank you so much for this day, Lord. I pray that as we're about to learn the Book of John, that we may understand the depths of the um, Book of John, Lord, that all our doubts will be cleared up and understand the life of John. And thank you so much, Lord, that our understanding will line up with your understanding, God. Thank you for everything. Fill us with your wisdom. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Asha. Um, all right. So today we would uh, look into John chapter 3. And uh, John chapter 3 is a very familiar um, chapter, um, especially because of John 3.16. Uh, but then we'll see what um, new insights we can gain from this passage and also what learnings that we can gain for our own lives. All right, so let's get started. And as usual, um, you know, uh, even as I uh, request you to read out one verse or two verses, uh, if you could read it out. And, um, you know, um, uh, don't hesitate to read. Uh, you know, just as soon as I ask, uh, one of you can just begin to read, uh, you know, so you don't have to you know, wait and hesitate uh, so that we can maybe cover a little more extra things, you know, in today's passage. Mm, so, um, we will begin, of course, with verse uh, 1. And if you could just have someone read out just verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Yes, that's how the chapter begins. Now, of course, the chapters were all introduced uh, later when they had the, you know, uh, other translations in the original it was not divided into chapters uh, but anyway uh, the people who did the division regarded this to be a good starting point for this particular chapter uh, and so we have uh, Nicodemus being introduced as a Pharisee who belonged to the uh, Jewish ruling council uh, now earlier in chapter 2 uh, verse 23 I think we had seen, uh, you know, a statement made over there, John 2.23, where it said, now, while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name. So over here, uh, uh, the statement made was that people saw the signs he was performing. All of these signs were pointing towards something. They were indicating something. Uh, they seemed to be implying that this person who was able to do extraordinary things must definitely be the Messiah. So when the people saw these signs, these indications, uh, they began to be convinced that this must be the promised Messiah. And so one of the persons who has seen these signs uh, is Nicodemus. And therefore, he now comes to uh, Jesus to have a conversation with him. And uh, if we could re uh, read out verse 2, please. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is, is with him. Yeah, so he's, uh, he has come there with a very specific purpose. He wants to know something. And so he, his opening lines are this. He says, uh, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. Why are we saying that? Because, you know, it says here, uh, no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. So it's very, very clear that you have come from God. And so Nicodemus, uh, I think, is about to ask the question, because you seem to have come from God, now are you the Messiah that we have been waiting for? Because that's the question which they posed to uh, John the Baptist earlier. And uh, John the Baptist was very plain in uh, replying that, no, I am not the Messiah who has been promised. I'm only preparing the way. So now um, here is someone else who is uh, performing signs which indicate that he is from God. And so now Nicodemus probably wants to confirm uh, whether this is the promised Messiah. And uh, we have a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, theories raised about why he comes to Jesus at night. Uh, now, me giving my personal opinion, uh, I don't think he was afraid or scared because at that point of time, 
um, I mean, most scholars believe that this incident took place uh, somewhere around the beginning of Jesus' ministry. So at that time, the opposition had not really increased against Jesus to an extent where Nicodemus would feel afraid to be associated with Jesus. I think he's just being cautious because he's a public figure. He's a member of the ruling council. Uh, he's um, somebody whose opinion people you know, would look up to. And so he needs to be careful whom he is associating with and uh, what he is saying about those people that he is associating with. And so he comes privately, first of all, to find out whether this indeed is the Messiah. And then he can, you know, maybe publicly acknowledge his loyalty to him. And uh, so with that uh, intention, with that intention, uh, we see Nicodemus coming first to have a private conversation and really verify whether this is the promised Messiah. Okay, so, uh, and um, yeah, so he asks, I mean, he, 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 he says, uh, I, it looks as though you are from God, depending on the signs that you are doing. And then um, uh, Jesus uh, is, this is Jesus' reply to that statement of, uh, of Nicodemus, which we see in verse 3. If you could have someone read out verse 3, please. Jesus answered, Jesus answered, Jesus answered, Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now we see no connection between what uh, Nicodemus just said and what Jesus is now saying, and there seems to be a real disconnect. Now, of course, we know that all the conversations here recorded in our uh, Bible are not literally verbatim, word by word translations, because that would take up too much space. So we have uh, summarizations of conversations. So even over here, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, John has chosen to summarize this particular conversation in this compact manner you know, into a few verses. And so he would have been highly careful in what he's choosing to convey of that conversation. And it's so it is so interesting that you have um, uh, Nicodemus making a statement like this, saying, I think you are from God and is kind of waiting for confirmation whether this is the Messiah. And Jesus takes up a topic which is in no way connected to what he's trying to say. And Jesus says, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. So Nicodemus seems to have come over here trying to verify whether this is the Messiah whom they have been waiting for. Jesus, on the other hand, seems to be saying, uh, it's all very well that you're looking for the Messiah, but do you even realize your deep need for the Messiah? Maybe first you should understand where you are, your condition, your need for the Messiah, and then I will tell you whether I am the Messiah or not. So Jesus brings um, uh, Nicodemus' focus onto a more vital point, his personal need for a Messiah, because Nicodemus probably is under the impression that he is a good person who does not need any kind of spiritual uh, uh, help or, or spiritual salvation. All he is probably looking for is a Messiah who will come and take over the throne once again and restore the kingdom of Israel. So Jesus first sets out to correct this man's perspective and then talk about messiahship and all of that. Um, and uh, so Jesus takes this new line and he says, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Um, now, um, this would have uh, sounded rather strange to Nicodemus and in fact to any of the other Jews because they had been taught from childhood that if they are the descendants of Abraham, if they are God's chosen ones, then uh, it's really a piece of cake. I mean, they all are going to make it into heaven because they are uh, descendants of Abraham, the one that God chose and God promised and said, through you, you know, I will prepare a nation for myself and all the nations of the earth will be blessed through you. So uh, they are so assured of their place in heaven. And Nicodemus is also under the same impression. And now here is Jesus saying a person needs to be born a second time only then, you know, would he even get into the kingdom of God. And uh, so what Jesus is saying here would have sounded rather surprising uh, to Nicodemus. 
Now, we are not very sure exactly how Nicodemus would have understood this particular statement because the word used over there, uh, you know, the Greek word anothen, uh, that can be translated as unless they are born again, or it can be translated as unless they are born from above. The word anothen can mean again, or the word anothen can also mean from above. In fact, we see it used as from above in John 3. 31. Uh, um, if someone could just read out that little phrase over there in 331. John 331. Uh, he who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth drinks to the earth yeah. and speaks in an earthly way. Yeah, that's, uh, that should be enough. Thank you so much. So over here, the word that is used, the one who comes anothen is above all, the one who comes from above. So this word over here, when it is used earlier in, in verse 3, it could mean unless they are born again, or it could mean unless they are born from above. All right. So it could be either one of those uh, translations. And um, Nicodemus is very puzzled by this. And we see him making his statement in verse 4. So if we could now have someone read out verse 4 for us. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Yeah. So um, when uh, Nicodemus hears Jesus' words, he's thinking about, a physical birth so his question is obvious he says you know it's impossible for a person to be physically born a second time uh, and um, he kind of fails to make the connection because uh, I mean he is a man who is a teacher uh, of the law so he is aware of his Old Testament uh, scriptures and um, um, there are scriptures where God talks about a new kind of birth uh, but right now he has not yet made that connection he's thinking more in terms of physical birth so he says you know how is it even possible for a person to be born a second time physically uh, but then you know if we were to um, kind of reflect upon Jeremiah 31 33 uh, where, um, you know, I'll just read that out. It says, uh, the Lord is speaking and he says, this is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write it on their hearts. So God is talking about creating something new. He says, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. So um, over here, when Jesus makes his statement about someone entering the kingdom of God uh, and being born from above, uh, he, Jesus is talking about how God from above will put his law in the minds of people. He will write it on their hearts and then they will be in a, in a position to want God. They will want to honor him and submit to him and they will be in a position uh, to be part of his family and also enter his kingdom. Um, so uh, there are these um, very um, important scriptures from the Old Testament, uh, which the people of Israel at that time uh, were depending upon. They considered these things to be uh, at the core of their uh, belief system. Um, so um, maybe we could have one person read out Deuteronomy chapter 30 uh, verses 1 to 6. I know it's a rather lengthy passage, uh, but then you see this is something that they were clinging on to. The people, Nicodemus and the people, were clinging on to the promises being made over here. So if someone could read out for us Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 1 to 6. Yes. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 1 to 6. And when all these things come upon you, the blessings and the curse which I have set before you, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God has given you, and return to the Lord your God, you and your children, and obey his voice in all that I command you today, with all your heart and with all your soul, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have mercy on you, and he will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you, if you 
if your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of the heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will take you. Up to verse 4? Uh, 4, 5 and 6, please. Okay, five, yeah, five, 4 is done. And the Lord your God will bring you into the land that your fathers possessed, that you may possess it, and he will make you more prosperous and numerous than your fathers. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring, so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, that you may live. Amen. Okay, so, yes, amen. So there are two important promises being made over here to the people of Israel. The first is that the Lord would gather them from all the nations where he has scattered them. And uh, the people, in fact, saw this happening. They had gone, uh, been taken away to the land of Babylon, and there was no hope of them ever being restored. And it's so extraordinary. The emperor, the king of that land, voluntarily says, I know, go back to your place. And I, in fact, will uh, will help you in rebuilding your temple. So he returns all the stolen uh, vessels and uh, the the uh, you know the objects of purification and sacrifice which had been stolen earlier by Nebuchadnezzar. That emperor sends them back with his royal support to go back to their own land to restore their temple. And uh, so, in a most extraordinary manner, the Lord gathers them from all the nations where they have been scattered. And so, they see this promise of God being fulfilled. Now, the second promise that is made over there in that particular passage is that God himself would circumcise their hearts and, and they would um, then be able to love him with all of their hearts and souls. So they believe, uh, the people of Nicodemus, they believed um, that these two promises have been fulfilled by the Lord already. And um, they are just waiting for the third main promise to be fulfilled, which we would see in Jeremiah 23, verses 5 to 6. Uh, if someone could read out Jeremiah 23, 5 to 6, please. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell safely. Now this is his name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness. Okay, so uh, they are happy and confident that God has finished fulfilling the first two promises of regathering them and also circumcising their hearts. And so they are just waiting for this third promise to be fulfilled, where you would have the king who will come and reign wisely and who will bring back justice and right into the land. So um, Nicodemus has now come with a hope that maybe this is the person who will be fulfilling this third promise. And uh, so Jesus needs to reorient his thinking and help him see that no circumcision has actually happened in people's hearts yet. There are a lot of them who are still following um, just the, the outward form of the law without allowing the law to have any kind of uh, work of transformation inside their hearts. So uh, that uh, Nicodemus needs to be able to see. And uh, so Jesus is basically trying to lead the conversation in that direction to help him see that the first promise has been fulfilled. The people have been regathered back to Jerusalem. But the second promise of circumcision is not yet um, been done. Uh, and um, so the coming of the king to reign once again will be uh, a thing of the future. Because first of all, the second promise needs to be fulfilled. Uh, and so. Um, Jesus goes on to say in verse 5 uh, about uh, some more details regarding how to enter the kingdom. Uh, so if we could, if someone could read out verse 5 for us.
Jesus answered, Please continue, Asha. Thank you. Jesus answered, Very, very, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Okay, and um, so a person needs to be born of water and the Spirit, and a person who has fulfilled both of these conditions, only that person will enter into the kingdom of God. And uh, so there has been a lot of debate on what exactly this phrase means. Um, but um, uh, it is very clear from verse 10, you know, which we would come to later, where Jesus seems to think that Nicodemus, being a teacher, will obviously understand what he is saying. So we have to assume that whatever is being said over here in verse 5, um, it must be something out of the Old Testament, something that Nicodemus, as a teacher of uh, God's word, would be familiar with. Uh, so uh, the best interpretation for this phrase, born of water and the spirit, um, would have to be uh, Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 25 to 28. Okay, so Ezekiel 36, 25 to 28, if we could have someone read out, please. Ezekiel. Go ahead, Charles. I was inquiring whether it was Ezekiel chapter 36, verse what? 36, 25 to 28. All right. It goes like this uh, 25. I will sprinkle clean water on you. And you shall be clean mm -hmm. from all your uncleanness and from all your idols. I will cleanse you, and I will give you a new heart, a new spirit. I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh, and give you a heart of flesh. Amen. And verse twenty-seven, also, please. Oh, okay. Verse twenty-seven, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. And so over here, we see that the person will be born of water and born of the spirit. God is saying that this is what he would do. Um, so this is what Jesus is referring to when he is talking about how a person can enter into the kingdom of God only when they are born of water and born of the spirit. Uh, so this um, is something that uh, Nicodemus would be familiar with. It's just that right now he is rather confused and has not yet made the connection with the Old Testament scriptures uh, at this particular point of time. Uh, yes, we have... Uh, ah, I'm so sorry. I would not know how to pronounce your name. Uh, if you could tell us how your name is pronounced, and then uh, you can ask your question. Go ahead, please. Oh, my name is Shay Ma. Um, thank you, Ma, for giving me the opportunity to ask my question. Shay, I just wanted Shay, to right? She, yes, she. Okay, she, sure. Yeah, you're correct. Um, so the scripture says, Jesus first mentions that no man would be able to see the kingdom unless he's born again. He now describes further and says, until a man is born of the spirit and of water, he will not enter into the kingdom of God. Hmm. My question is, seeing and entering, are they the same thing? Was Jesus referring to the same thing? Was he just basically explaining what he was earlier saying? Or is there a difference between a person seeing the kingdom and then entering the kingdom? Hmm. Well, you are referring to verse 3, which comes first. Yeah. No one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. So um, over here, it's obviously not just referring to the kingdom on earth. It's also referring to the person entering into heaven one day. So a person will not enter into the heaven heavens one day and see with his eyes uh, God's uh, dwelling place. 
and he will not be able to uh, behold that with his eyes unless he is first uh, you know born again so uh, it's in that sense so over here in verse 5 jesus is using a different wording rather than saying seeing he is saying no one can enter so it's obviously after we enter in that we would see and behold the dwelling place of god and we will be able to stay there with him forever and ever so it's just two different ways of expressing um our ability to go into his presence and dwell over there one day i suppose yeah yeah uh, all right. thank you Mark. just one more, one more question again just one more question yeah. my apologies for taking time so I, I i know that ultimately we all will will enter into his kingdom which is mm -hmm. heaven but mm -hmm. again i'm looking at i'm looking at these verses could jesus be referring more than just going to heaven well uh everyone dwelling in jesus day were getting a chance to see the kingdom of god entering into the world because jesus says now the kingdom of heaven has come you know so they are seeing the beginnings of god's kingdom being established here on earth but not everyone was part of it uh, they only ended up as uh, mere viewers of what what is taking place only some believed and placed their faith in him and began to be part of that kingdom so in that sense uh, is you know, i mean uh, your question is is he referring to just heaven or even the kingdom of god taking shape down here yes everyone in fact uh, who could see and hear were seeing the beginnings of the kingdom of god coming in uh, they could see the signs and the miracles they could see the new value system that jesus was bringing in a higher moral uh, system all of that they could see so at a human level everyone could see it everyone could hear it but only the ones who believed in it and uh, chose to make a commitment to him and submit to him as messiah and lord only they actually became part of this kingdom which was taking shape uh, so yes the kingdom of god is also on the earth at the moment um, in in the sense that we see god doing his work fulfilling his purposes but of course the ultimate would be uh, heaven and the new jerusalem where the entire kingdom would be in in a, would reach its completion at, at at that point of time yeah thank you so much man thank you thank you all right then um so <coughs> sorry uh, so we looked at ezekiel 36 25 to 28 which explains to us what what is meant by born of water and born of the spirit and um, then we come to verse 6 uh, yeah if someone could read out for us 6 and 7 please That which is born of flesh, of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Okay, so um, the main problem with uh, people like Nicodemus and the other godly people who genuinely cared about the things of God, they were trying to live good lives. They were trying to be righteous, but these were things that they were trying to do in the flesh. So you see, uh, whatever they did, their efforts would always uh, fall short of perfection. You know, everyone falls short of God's uh, perfect standards. No one can reach up to that level. Uh, it is only through the work of the Spirit where you know uh, uh, God forgives us of what we are and just simply freely grants to us Jesus righteousness. Uh, so only those uh, people can say that we are truly righteous because now they are no longer depending on their own human righteousness. They are now simply freely putting on the righteousness of Christ, which has been given to them freely. So over here, Jesus is trying to bring across that point that a physical birth uh, and a physical work of righteousness is not enough. Flesh gives birth to flesh. However hard Nicodemus and the other godly people are going to try to live good lives, they will always fall short of the perfect righteousness which God expects. Only Jesus is that righteous. And 
So Jesus has to freely give it to us. And only then we will be able to enter into the kingdom of God. So these are all uh, uh, things that Jesus is uh, beginning to explain to Nicodemus. Of course, in later, of, he would have you know, explained these things in greater detail to him. But this is the initial conversation that is going on. Um, and uh, so he says uh, in verse uh, 8, you know, he, um, yeah, if, if someone could read out verse 8 for us, please. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but cannot tell whence it comes and where it goes. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. So uh, this is a very interesting uh, point that uh, Jesus makes here. He says, uh, you know, at a human level, you know how the wind operates. In the sense, you have seen it blowing up things. You know, you have seen it. Uh, you can feel it on your skin when it is blowing by. Uh, you have seen all of that. Now, you don't really understand the physics behind it. You don't really know how this wind comes, from where it comes, why it is more uh, strong and violent sometimes, and where it is, uh, where, why, and why sometimes it's just a gentle breeze. What are the things that makes it, you know, uh, stir up into a, some kind of a storm? And what is it that makes it so gentle sometimes? These are all things that a person doesn't understand. But one thing they know, they can hear it. When the wind comes, they can hear it. And then they can choose whether they want to respond to that sound or not. You know, they can quickly go running and close all their windows. Or they can just ignore what they have heard. In the same way, you know, Jesus is saying over here, you may not really understand everything there is to know about the spirit, but you can hear the spirit. You can sense him in your heart. And without having understood all the details, you can either choose to respond or you can choose not to respond. So here, Nicodemus is asking for explanations. Um, and it's not yet time to be to reveal all of the full explanations. Because later, uh, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, Paul will come along. The other you know, uh, apostles will come along. And then they will explain to us, to the church, uh, the, the, the full meaning of all of these things. Right now, it is still too early uh, to be giving out the details of these things. And so Jesus is saying, just like the wind, you don't really understand all of it. But you hear it and you respond. In the same way, at this stage, are you willing to just uh, receive what the Spirit is now speaking to you in your heart? Okay, So uh, Jesus is kind of asking uh, Nicodemus to be ready in his heart to receive these new things which Jesus is revealing. Um, and uh, then uh, let's just come to verse 10, maybe. Uh, and we could, yeah, maybe we can have someone read out verses 10 and 11. He reads, You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus. And do you not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify of what we have seen. But still, you people do not accept our testimony. Okay, so over here, Jesus says, We speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen. Uh, so over here, the uh, we probably refers to uh, John the Baptist who came and gave his testimony. And then Jesus himself is now speaking up. And uh, we also have the witness of the uh, Father and the Spirit. Um, you know, so the we probably talks about people who have started to talk about the Messiah and have started to explain who the Messiah is. So he says, we have... Uh, testified about what we have seen and what we know, but you do not accept our testimony. And over here uh, in NIV, just to make the meaning more clear, they have used the term you people, because over here the you is not talking about Nicodemus alone. It's talking about plural. You know, and the plural word is used, but you do not accept our testimony. Maybe specifically, Jesus is talking about you Pharisees are not accepting the uh, testimony um, because uh, they have um, they are learned people and they have already made up their minds that this is what the old old testament scriptures are saying and now they may not be that willing and open to to accept a new interpretation of the old testament scriptures so jesus is uh, uh, saying 
uh, this, there are new things being revealed about these Old Testament scriptures. And uh, we are testifying about something that has been seen. Uh, but you are not accepting our testimony. So Jesus is kind of telling Nicodemus, don't fall into that category. Don't be like these other Pharisees who are unwilling to learn, unwilling to hear the voice of the Spirit, and without even having fully understood all the details, being willing to submit and say, OK, this is a new truth that I am willing to accept. So uh, Jesus is asking him to have a different attitude from the other Pharisees. Um, Oh, what else can we look at? Yeah, maybe we can have, uh, maybe we, we could read out verses 12 and 13. Verse 12 and 13. Oh, okay. um, the Bible says, If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. So over here, Jesus um, uh, refers to himself as the Son of Man. This is something that we looked at last class, I think, uh, where um, you know the term Son of Man is a direct reference to what is mentioned about the Messiah in Daniel 7. So uh, now finally, Jesus is coming to the topic which was first raised by Nicodemus because Nicodemus had come over there trying to verify whether this is the Messiah and now by you know through these sentences in 12 and 13 Jesus is confirming that yes I am indeed the Messiah and I am telling you new things are you willing to believe are you willing to trust um, and of course later on you know uh, even as we read the Gospels we get to know that Nicodemus does believe he does place his trust in Jesus. Um, so uh, verses 13 and 14 are um, um, a little uh, debated and people are a little confused about these two uh, verses. Uh, so maybe we can look at that. Uh, if we could read out 13, 14, 15, yes. Right, 13. No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Yeah. Um, some people find it upsetting that for some reason Jesus. Uh, seems to want to link himself to a snake, uh, I know, and um, uh, the Son of Man is being compared to the snake that was lifted up in the uh, in the wilderness. Uh, that would be uh, the Numbers chapter twenty-one story. Uh, so they uh, kind of um, uh, you know um, people in our modern times they say why why would Jesus do that? Uh, going and comparing the Son of Man the Messiah, the, the promised one, you know, the righteous one. Why would someone, uh, why would Jesus want to compare someone like that with a snake? Um, uh, that's because of the kind of modern, uh, you know, uh, negative implications that are attached to the snake. Um, but uh, to the Israelites, this would have made a lot of sense. Even in Numbers 21, when, when, when that uh, uh, bronze snake was first lifted up, uh, it would have made a lot of sense to them because um, G, uh, because God was trying to convey something to that specific group of people using imagery which they would have fully understood. Uh, and uh, so it would have been highly significant for them. So um, just to look at a little bit at this background of the Numbers uh, 21 story, um, we know, right? I mean, if we were to go to Numbers 21, uh, it's the story would be in uh, verses 4 to 9. Uh, the people are now going through the wilderness, and uh, they're not very happy because uh, um, they are, I mean, uh, God is providing them with manna on a daily basis, uh, but they want to have other things. And uh, so it's a very shocking thing uh, that, in fact, uh, uh, they say in 
verse 5 i think in numbers 21 verse 5 uh, they uh, they they say we detest this miserable food i mean it's such a shocking thing to say god is freely miraculously providing them with food in a place where there is absolutely no food and thousands of people are getting fed every single day without putting in any effort and instead of appreciating and really praising god for what is being provided uh, they actually say this they say we detest this miserable food and that's such a shocking statement uh, and uh, so obviously because of their attitude uh, god's judgment comes upon them and you have poisonous snakes which come and uh, bite the people and a lot of them begin to die and uh, then moses prays uh, on behalf of the people and god says uh, in verse 8 numbers 21 verse 8 make a snake and put it up on a pole anyone who is bitten can look at it and they will live why did god at that point of time why did he ask moses to make a bronze snake and put it up on a pole now uh, we know that snake uh, had a lot of significance for the egyptians and uh, that is basically where the people of israel had been living and the hearts of the people of israel was full of egyptian culture egyptian religion egyptian lore uh, because joshua chapter 24 very openly says to us that these people when they were living over there rather than worshiping yahweh they were very very busy worshiping the gods of the egyptians so the egyptian gods were something that the you know, that these israelite people would have been highly familiar with and we see something being done in exodus chapter 7 verses 8 to 12. this is your initial story when um, moses and aaron first go to pharaoh and we know right i mean at that point of time there's a sign which is given god uh, gives a sign which they can show to pharaoh where uh, uh, you know aaron would throw down the uh, staff the wooden staff the wooden rod which he is holding and that would turn into a snake and then we know the story how even the magicians the egyptian magicians are also able to turn their wooden staffs into snakes and then we know the outcome uh, aaron's um, uh, staff uh, aaron's snake is able to swallow up all of the other snakes and why why is that entire sign being given over there to show uh, the snake was one of the chief gods of the egyptians and when aaron's snake swallows up all of the other snakes very openly yahweh is demonstrating and showing you think that you know that your gods are real and that they have power but look your snakes got swallowed up your gods got swallowed up by aaron's uh, uh, wooden staff and uh, so there's a point that was being uh, made over there and even when you look at uh, you know the the you know, if you've seen uh, clip art of uh, Pharaoh, paintings of Pharaoh, you always see him wearing that crown with that snake sticking out over there in the front. Uh, and that was a very important symbol because you see that, that snake, that god uh, of the Egyptians symbolized that even if this Pharaoh falls sick, he would be healed. That snake god would bring him healing. It would protect him from all bad uh, omens and things like that so the crown of the pharaoh would always have that uh, thing uh, sticking out uh, so here in the wilderness when the people are saying oh i wish we had not left egypt i wish we were still over there we don't want to eat this miserable manna and you know they're uh, really cribbing about the whole thing and uh, god's judgment comes upon them and then god says to moses to raise up a bronze serpent and god is you know conveying the message to the israelites and saying you want to go back over there to egypt you want to go back to those gods but you know what healing and deliverance doesn't come from those gods you look at this bronze snake which i am setting up over here and healing will come to you from me not from those gods so there's a very clear distinction that god is making over there in that particular passage and he is showing that uh, he is above all and all these other entities which may have some power uh, you know uh, they are not gods in any sense of the word so we see that those things um, being brought out in the numbers 21 story and now over here jesus is ref referring to that particular story and he says in the same way that bronze serpent was lifted up at that time now in this day i am going to be lifted up 
and whoever believes in me they will be saved so um uh, you can have people who are still looking to other messiahs uh, who are looking to other saviors to deliver them or you could be like those israelites those few israelites who were willing to you know lift up their eyes and look at the uh, the bronze serpent and you know save their lives you can be like that you can choose to place your faith in me the true messiah even though what i'm saying may not make sense to you you can choose to be like that or you can be like the other you know israelites of that time i mean they all were getting bitten and they all were dying right so there were a huge camp of thousands of people so anyone who really wants to look at the bronze snake would have to crawl them you know and come over here in their bitten condition even as they are dying they would have to come all the way to wherever that bronze uh, snake has been um, placed and they would have to look upon it and believe in it it would it would take some amount of effort and some amount of belief uh but some were willing to do that others would have said here i am bitten who's going to go and look at one bronze snake out there and they would not have gone so uh there would be two kinds of attitudes now jesus was saying i am going to be lifted up who is willing to believe me so there would be some people who would be willing to believe in him and look upon him as the messiah as the true savior and there would be others who would say ha huh, what can one person on a cross do and you know they would probably continue looking to other saviors and other messiahs to uh, for their deliverance and that would not work um so those are all the points which jesus is um bringing across even as he says these things so um ah uh, yeah we someone has raised their hand okay it's 9:47 we were supposed to have a break at uh, 5 let's see if it's a short question we will finish with it now uh, so yes please go ahead charles yeah thank you i'm looking at the imagery that god used to use the the god of egypt to be put on a cross on a, on a pole so that those that are going to take the faith and look at that uh, brazen serpent they will be healed by the god of heaven oh, no not at all not at all uh the israelites and the egyptians who had all placed their faith in those egyptian gods believed that those mm-hmm. snake gods would be able to deliver but yahweh said those gods are not even real gods they can do nothing and so god raises up a bronze statue just a mere statue just like aaron's staff aaron's wooden staff was uh, became a snake it was not a god in any sense of the word it was just a wooden staff but it took on the shape of a snake to convey a message to these people who are all snake worshipers in the same way here in the wilderness as well the bronze serpent which moses has made it is not a representation of the egyptian gods it is saying that these gods are useless on the other hand this image which god has created that uh, is a symbol of god's power so the same way aaron's staff which turned into a snake is not a god in any sense of the word the bronze serpent which was raised in the wilderness is also not a god in any sense of the word these two are symbols which are saying um egyptian gods versus god's symbol egyptian gods on one side and uh, yahweh's symbology the symbols that he is using of a staff which turns into a snake or of a of a bronze serpent which is lifted upon a pole these are just symbols that he is using to point to who he is and how powerful he is so when the people who are getting bitten over there in the wilderness would go and look at that bronze serpent they are not looking at uh, the egyptian gods not at all in fact this particular bronze snake probably would not even have looked the way the um, egyptian idols would have looked because god is definitely not trying to say that uh, he is using an idol over there as his symbol no definitely not um, he is saying that if you believe in uh, bullocks hey you know what i am a more powerful bullock i am the all ultimate bullock you are you, are you people worshiping goats you know what i am the ultimate goat it was i'm i'm just you know using a very very weak example but what i'm trying to get across is he is using the terminology which is familiar to those people and is speaking in uh, in terms that they can understand and is he saying you're looking to these things these things are nothing you know what i am the ultimate 
so in that sense so that bronze serpent which was raised in the wilderness was not an egyptian god it was not meant to be a representation of egyptian god it was meant to be a symbol of the all powerful yahweh who is far above any snakes that the egyptians can come up with uh, in that sense uh, is that kind of clear please <laughs> Yeah, just, uh, just uh, it is clear, but I am looking at these Israelites that had seen the God of Egypt as a serpent. Don't you think some of them might have come to look at the snake, remembering the culture they left behind? If they had come with that uh, kind of a belief and looked upon that snake, I doubt it would have helped them in any way they probably would not have got healed because when Moses, Moses would have taken some time to make it right. I mean, he didn't exactly have a bronze serpent sitting in his uh, bag. So he would have had some, uh, taken some time to actually mold it and make it. And while that process was going on, the elders and leaders would have explained to the people what is going on, why God has asked for this and what it means. So all that would have been very clearly explained to the people in the summary that we have of, of a few verses. We don't really get all the details, but no way would uh, Moses have done that without first explaining to the people what is being shown, why it is being shown, what is trying to be conveyed to them. So very clearly, all of that would have been explained to the people. Um, you know, so it would have taken at least maybe an hour, one hour at the most because I mean people are dying, so it has to be done quickly. So it would have been done, but at least there would have been one hour of time where some clear explanation would have been given to the people of how God is trying to show that He is the real deliverer, He is the real healer, and uh, these Egyptian snake gods are nothing. So. Um, if after having listened to all of that explanation, if someone had gone over there still hoping to look at that serpent and compare it in his mind to the Egyptian gods, I doubt it would have done him any good because the healing would come from, um, from Yahweh. So the person would have to place his faith in Yahweh, not in those gods. Yeah, something like that. Does that help? All right. So uh, yeah, uh, let's take a break now. So at uh, 10 o'clock, uh, we will re resume our class. Thank you.